Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back. And in this video, I want to talk to you about uh, one of the more high powered uh, user interface elements in GeoPix that has a lot of you know built in features and shortcuts that are not super obvious to uh, the top level view. And that is the attribute editor. Uh, this is a panel that is present in every single one of the main application tabs you have you know, over here in the perform canvas, the widget attributes. And in I.O., we have the node attributes. This shows up in other places, too. So if you open your preferences, you'll uh, you'll see a similar pattern right here for editor, lighting, uh, timeline, and it just goes on and on. A lot of these, not all, but a lot of them have uh, this, this built in. So uh, this is important because, like I said, it's got a lot of... Um, a lot of features built in that most UI elements in GeoPix do not typically have. And that's really because you're going to be spending a lot of time adjusting values. And in a place like the editor, it, it really helps your workflow to, to kind of know how these things work and to exploit it to your advantage. So, all right, <clears throat> to kind of test and show you things, we're just going to make a default primitive object here, a simple cube. And uh, we'll just dive into the parameters over here and start talking about things. So the majority of this video is really going to be about value parameters uh, because, you know, to be honest, the other stuff is pretty straightforward. We have uh, buttons, we have menus, uh, and you can drag menus as sliders. Um, getting ahead of myself a little bit here. But yeah, we have a lot of different parameters, but the ones that we really want to talk about are the value parameters, and we're going to spend a lot of time up here talking about those. So, Okay. <clears throat> So as you can see here, if we move this and we'll talk about the actual editor controls in another video, we have our TX, TY, and TZ moving along with our cube. Makes sense. <clears throat> so, uh, well, how do we adjust these in the actual panel? There's a few ways. Uh, if you just click and drag on the actual value, you can treat this as a slider. And pretty much any parameter that is value-based is going to have this control. Now. Depending on the parameter, this may not be that useful because, as you can see here, uh, it's not very sensitive It's or it's too sensitive. It's not very um, precise, uh, and so you don't have a lot of control over where things get placed. Uh, so depending on the parameter type, it may be more useful than others. So, for example, in scale, it's a much smaller range for this parameter, so you have a lot tighter control. Uh, so it really depends on what it is you're setting and just what its built-in range is. Okay, so in addition to dragging it as a slider, you can also just use your mouse wheel. And I recommend using GeoPix with a mouse. If you're using it with a trackpad, good luck. Uh, but yeah, you can adjust this with a scroll wheel. And this gives you a little bit more precise control, at least, at least adjust it in consistent increments. Uh, in addition to that, you can hold control and shift in smaller increments. You can hold shift and adjust in extremely large increments. So that gives you some extra ways to adjust parameters. And that really comes in handy. Uh, on parameters that have, um, you know, smaller ranges and things like that. Now you notice what I just did is I right clicked on these labels and it reset the values to the defaults. So if you have a bunch of uh, non-default values, you can just right click on any of these and it will take you back to uh, square one. So in addition to right clicking on the labels, you can actually left click on a label too. And what that does is it launches the field or the first field in that row. So you can start typing in a value. So if I want to type in 50 and hit enter, and if I want to uh, do that for TY, I can uh, do that here as well. And TZ on 50, and you get the idea. You can also double click on a field and that's going to launch the, uh, I'm sorry, you can, you can double click on a slider and it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna launch that field for you. So if you can type in 50, you can hit tab, and you can go to the next one, and you can go to the next one, and so on and so forth. Pretty standard stuff. So in addition to that, uh, since we're on the labels, you'll notice that we have these question marks hovering. And this is not so much a, an adjustment technique, but it is very helpful. So if you see these, and you don't know what a parameter is or does, or you just want to know more about it, click on it. And it's going to tell you whatever uh, I have currently entered for that. Now, as you navigate through GeoPix, you're going to see some things don't have information that pop up, and that's just because I haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, but, you know, depending on when you're watching this video, that may not be true. They may all be documented, but everything in the editor should pretty much be documented. So, and of course, if you want fuller explanations, there'll be videos and stuff like that on the wiki. But anyways, 
help information is built right into this attribute editor. So if you see the question marks, you know that this is that kind of panel. So uh, something to keep in mind. Okay, <clears throat> so we've gone through some of the basic ways to adjust things and some of the ways to enter the fields. Uh, really one of the most interesting and I think powerful features of the Uber GUI system is that you can type in units, um, values with different units, you can even mix and match units, and the field will be smart enough to evaluate that. So to show you that, uh, first I need to tell you a little bit about the GeoPix's unit system in the editor. Uh, every grid unit here that you see that it's gray is uh, by default you know, one meter. So when you create a, a default object here, this is like a one meter cube. In fact, all of your primitives are on some axis, you know, or multiple axes, um, a unit, a unit uh, primitive. So uh, that's helpful to know if you're just measuring things out. So if you create a cube and, and import your own, you know, human character, you can measure that up pretty quickly and say, okay, that seems roughly correct, or maybe it doesn't. Uh, anyways, that is something we'll cover in more depth later. Uh, but uh, you know, you may need to adjust things in. Uh, GeoPix by very specific measurements. So let's go and talk about that real quick. So over here in TX, if we type in a number, and by the way, these values over here, TX, TY, TZ, these are going to be in centimeters. Uh, while the grid is in meters, um, the actual translate values that you type in are going to be centimeters. So uh, if you just type in 100, whoops, that's 1,000, and you hit enter, this is going to move your cube over uh, 100 centimeters. And so um, when you just type in numbers, that's what you're doing. Um, so if I type in uh, 100 and I put a unit at the end, I'll just go into centimeters. This is going to do the exact same thing as typing in 100 because the default unit is centimeters. Okay, so if I type in one and I put M at the end, it's going to be smart enough to know that I'm talking about meters and it needs to convert that to centimeters. So if you do and type enter, it's gonna give you 100 as well. So this is very uh, helpful, but you know, if you're not using meters or centimeters or metric in general, you can also use imperial. So if I type in um, one inch, it's going to skew it over one inch, uh, 2.54, it might look familiar. Um, if you type in one uh, YD, it's going to move it over a yard. And so and you can mix and match these as well. So if you type in one meter plus 52 inches, it's going to basically evaluate those two segments and then it's going to add it together and type that in as centimeters. So very powerful system. Um, you can do uh, basically one meter. You can you can not do spaces if you want. You can uh, do multiplies. So I can do uh, one meter uh, times 25 inches. It's going to put it way off in the distance. Yeah, way out there. Um, we can also, you know, do divides. So one meter uh, divided by uh, two inches. And I give you 127. So there's lots of different ways to adjust things. Now you can also do the same thing over here for rotate and scale, but obviously those don't use the same units. So that's not as helpful. Just know that rotation is in degrees. Scale is just scale. So uh, to think about scale, uh, a scale of one, right, is going to uh, put you at kind of the default grid. Uh, to kind of make this more clear, let me go and move my cube over. Uh, 50, 50, and 50. And we'll talk about these things I'm doing later. I'm going to group the object so that I've got a pivot point down here. Uh, so, all right, we've got a one meter cube. As you can see, it's basically going one unit on the grid. So if I take this scale, which is... Uh, default scale of one, and I take this to a scale of two. Uh, we've now got a uh, cube that is now a rectangle, and it's stretching two units on x. So this is basically uh, the way to think about scale is meters, right? That seems a little bit strange, but because the default object is uh, 100 centimeters, you're actually talking in multiples, and a multiple of uh, one meter or two meters. Uh, that's how the scale system will basically look for a default. Uh, primitive object, but again, that all goes out the window if you're using complex hierarchies of objects with different groupings and parentings and scales and all that stuff. So 
Uh, definitely be careful with that. Uh, that's not an ironclad rule. It's just something to think about when you are starting out with a, a blank object in the scene. So just to kind of reiterate, let's say you have a blank scene and you are, maybe you're blocking out a truss, right? And you create a primitive object. <clears throat> if you know that this truss has a certain X, Y, Z dimensions, you can actually just type those in here, right? Uh, so I can say, um, 0.2 meters, oops, uh, 0.2, you don't want to type in meters here, uh, maybe this will be 1 and 0.2, and you can basically be sure that this is 0.2 meters, 0.2 meters, and 1 meter. So anyways, we'll talk more about that stuff later, but that is kind of a rundown of how to use the meters uh, and various measurement systems built right into the Uber GUI. <clears throat> And that pretty much sums it up. The one last thing I'll go ahead and mention here, and that is the name parameter. Um, naming in GeoPix is somewhat restrictive. You can't just name it with any kind of character. So if I type in some space cube and I press enter, you're going to notice that the space gets replaced with an underscore. Same thing if I do sum colon cube. Doesn't like that. It's going to put an underscore. So really, uh, it's best practice to just get in the habit of, of keeping your name simple anyways. Now, not all parameters that are string based uh, force this on you, right? Some things uh, do not. So to kind of show you an example of something that doesn't care, uh, let me create a fixture. Okay, so we've got a fixture object and while the name parameter is gonna be the same for all objects, we have other things in here that are string based like chan order. Now I wouldn't recommend messing with this uh, by hand. We'll, we'll talk about this later, but it, it does give you the ability to if you're an advanced user. So if I type in just random stuff, it's going to accept that, right? Now that might not work in GeoPix, but just keep in mind that some string parameters let you, but the name parameter is a special parameter uh, and it will basically keep you from getting wonky with the names. Now, one last thing to mention about names. If we have a couple objects here and we have, uh, you'll notice that when we duplicate an object, the name automatically changes. Uh, and that's because we can't have two objects with the same name. If you try to do this, it's going to yell at you. It's going to say one duplicate name detected and it's going to automatically rename it. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. Even if you have things grouped and separated um, hierarchically, you're still going to have to have separate names. Uh, within the editor and within the IO tab and etc etc so okay well that sums it up for this video uh, thanks for watching I hope that was helpful and stick around for the next one